Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Sam. Um, thank you so much for your patience. We're not actually sure what happened with um, your host today. So I work at Book Soup, but on behalf of Romans, thank you for joining us today for our event um, that is a thriller panel with Alexa Dawn, Lori Elizabeth Flynn, and Kara Thomas. And thank you all for your patience and hanging in there with us. And we are still going to go a full hour. So I hope you're at home and able to hang out with us. So today's event will end with a Q&A. And to submit a question, please use the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, you can click the like button and it'll bump it up in the queue. And we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And thank you, Julie. Yes, if you can't see us, please refer. If you can't see, but you can hear us, just refresh your screen. With Crowdcast, usually refreshing is the way to go. Um, so we'll be hosting more virtual events in the future, so you can learn more about them on our website. You can sign up for our email newsletter, follow us on social media at Romans Bookstore, and you can also follow the Crowdcast page right here to get direct notifications. And past events. Um, Actually, I don't know if Romans has a YouTube channel. I should know that. I'm not sure, but I think we do because Book I think Soup. So. Has a okay. <laughs> I know. Sorry. I do events for Book Soup, so I'm always paying attention to that. <laughs> so, also, please support our authors today by purchasing um, a copy of their books if you like. And you can do that by clicking the green button below the viewer screen, and it'll redirect you to the website where you can complete the checkout process and it won't interrupt viewing. So, you can do that at any time. And we're open for in store browsing. So, um, please stop by in Pasadena if you're local. And I believe masks are required again, so make sure you do that. And I'm sure we have some if you don't have one with you. And with that said, let me introduce our guest for the evening because you've been waiting long enough. So Alexa Dawn is the author of Brightly Burning and the Stars We Steal, sci-fi romance retellings of classic set in space. A graduate of Boston University, she works in TV marketing and has done pro bono college admissions mentoring since 2014. A true INJ in her free time, she mentors with Right Girl, organizes the author mentor match program and runs one of the most popular writing advice channels on YouTube. She lives in Los Angeles with two fluffy ginger cats named after characters from YA Lit. Find Alexa online at alexadon.com and at alexadon. Lori Elizabeth Flynn is a former model who lives in London, Ontario with her husband and three children. She is the author of three young adult novels. First, a Yalsa Best Fiction for Young Adults pick, along with Last Girl Lied To and All Eyes on Her under the name L.E. Flynn. And last but not least, Kara Thomas is an unsolved mystery enthusiast who dreams of one day solving a cold case. She lives on Long Island with her husband, son, and rescue cat. She is the author of The Darkest Corners, Little Monsters, The Cheerleaders, and That Weekend. To learn more about Kara and her books, visit her at kara-thomas.com or follow Kara T. Writes on Twitter and Kara Thomas Writes on Instagram. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to our authors this evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. And please sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. All right. Uh, hello. And I think I realized that I don't even think my bio mentions my current book, which is slightly hilarious, which is <laughs> the Ivy's. I should plug my own book anyway. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you guys. Uh, yes. You are some of my Thank favorite you. writers. For your patience. We feel yes. very loved that you guys stuck around for us. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> And Lori is in a park, which we love. It's beautiful and scenic. <laughs> much we've been camping for like a month now. So um, yeah, we've been on an extended road trip. So nice um, park background here. So <laughs> I feel like there's a thriller in that. I feel, I feel totally. Like... <laughs> um, well, to start, um, why don't we talk about our latest books? and our inspiration for those books and then we have a ton of great q a and i might actually like jumble it around and jump around because i feel like some of the questions dovetail nicely but let's start with whatever our latest book is and why we wrote it yeah definitely who wants to go first i'll go first yeah i i i, I tend to be a, a hog so <laughs> i won't always go first I talk, I, too, I talk too fast, so good to get me out of the way. Um, so hi, I'm Kara Thomas. My latest book is That Weekend, and it's about a girl who skips her prom weekend and goes on a secret trip with two friends to her friend's lake, lake house in upstate New York. 
and 48 hours later, she wakes up on a hiking trail, bruised and bloodied and alone, and can't remember the past 48 hours, and her two best friends are missing. So she has to find out what happened that weekend and where her friends are and what role she played in their disappearance. I told you I talked that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What's <it gonna> <laughs> And, and it's what, really like, good. <laughs> I love your book. It's so good. I love yours. What, what led you to write that? Like, where did the oh, idea yeah, come from? The book. Sorry, it's like past my, my bedtime here in New York. Um, so I actually got the idea when I went on an overnight hiking, um, camping in the woods trip with my husband. Very, that's Lori's uh, dad. <laughs> Um, but we were hiking through the woods and there was kind of like a strange guy on one of the trails and he was just like kind of weird and like was friendly with us. But when we got to our spot on the ledge um, in that weekend, they, they are going to this place called, um, I think, Devil's Peak. And my hiking trip, we had gone to a place called Devil's Ledge. And I just thought like, wow, we are so vulnerable out here. We don't have cell phone service. We're completely alone. And I mean, you're, you're in a tent. You're not protected. And I thought of that strange guy. And of course, my, my mind goes there um, as a thriller writer. I was like, I think I found my next book because what is more terrifying than the idea of being like in a tent and with your friends and you just wake up one morning and they're, they're not in the tent where they're supposed to be. Lori is now rethinking her entire trip. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I love that. And Jen, it's it's we'll talk a little more about inspiration in, in a bit but it is kind of fascinating like how we can turn ordinary things into murder books <laughs> it's how our brain works well yeah i mean uh, when you have anxiety on top of it it's very easy to, to go there what about you Lori? um my latest book is actually my first adult thriller which is called the girls are also nice here it came out in march and um, I don't know, I've like totally lost time of track of timing with the pandemic. So I'm like, March, wow, how long ago was that? Anyway, um, it's um, sort of been pitched as like a darker, more disturbing Mean Girls meets I Know What You Did Last Summer. So it's told in dual timeline and it involves a um, woman who is summoned back to her 10 year college reunion. And um, when she gets there, she sort of realizes she's being circled by someone who knows the truth about what she did freshman year. So one of the timelines is told during freshman year and sort of reveals, you know, what she did that was so horrible. And the timeline at the reunion sort of is uh, much more condensed, but um, a lot of the same players appear and um, kind of unraveling the mystery of who wants her to pay for what she did and how could anyone possibly even know? And she thinks that she and her best friend kept it a secret. So it's very like uh, dark academia and, um, a lot it's of mean so girls. <laughs> oh, mean yeah. girls. We can talk about oh, mean girls. Being the best. <laughs> <laughs> and so did you did you go to your college reunion and, and get inspired or, or was it the mean girls that was your jumping off point? Yeah, like I, I've never been to a reunion, so I don't even um, I can't say that was my inspiration. I think I just like I love campus novels, so I really wanted to set one there. So I basically crafted this story because I really wanted that setting. And all of my books have mean girls in them. Like I can't get away from them. <laughs> so it just felt like a natural jumping off point, especially being a YA author and having one of the timelines be told from an 18 year old protagonist. It felt very like a natural transition for me. So it was a lot of fun. Awesome. And uh, so the Ivies is um, competitive college admissions meets murder. It's about a group of girls, mean girls themes, uh, <laughs> who have been sabotaging their classmates for two and a half years because they're they, they're going to get into the Ivy League come hell or high water. And then on early decision day, one of them who was not supposed to apply to Harvard, which is a whole thing, which is based on a real thing. There are limited slots to colleges at different schools like we can talk, well, I'll get to my inspiration. And that girl ends up dead. And the main character also secretly applied to Harvard and got in. And it's very possible that the Regina George of their group is a crazy killer. And also the main character, Olivia, she's, she might also be a suspect. So it's it goes from there. And I was inspired by, I've worked in competitive college admissions and I've seen things. And I was like, how is this not a YA novel yet? And 
and then I figured out an angle in because I don't write contemporary, but I can do murder. I can do murder. Murder's great. Um, and so, and yeah, Mean Girls. I have never been to boarding school and I have never been in that kind of friend group, but that's why I wrote about something like that because they terrify me. Mm -hmm. And they're the exact kind of girls who would never let me hang out with them. But I wanted to explore like what happens to you. Like if you're theoretically a good person, but ambitious. Uh, when you you fall in with the wrong kind of people, like how can you, how does that morph you and change you? I love that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and well, let's talk about Mean Girls. Yeah. <laughs> or mess, Mean Girls, Messy Girls, uh, complicated friendship dynamics. Cause like, I like your books and I wanted to do a panel with you. Cause I'm like, we, we, we have things in common that we love. So what is it about messy friendship dynamics, messy girls, mean girls that appeals to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's such a common thread between our books, like with friends, with friends like that, do you really need enemies? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm not sure what appeals to me the most about it. I've always just found that it, it lends itself to, to thriller as well because um, one of the most interesting questions I think you can ask in a thriller is how well do you know like the people who are really close to you? Um, I think that's what sets like a mystery apart from a thriller. It's not just like a, a dead body and who done it, who would want to kill this person. Um, the detective is gonna figure out who it was, but a thriller, it, it kind of dives into the motivations more and what the people that you, I, I think the most like exciting part of a thriller is when you're reading and you're trying to figure out who isn't what they seem because I mean, really no, nobody in a thriller is what they seem and just unpacking like their, their motivations um, and everything. So I just think it's interesting to write from a, from a character standpoint I agree. Um, for me, I think there's something like darkly relatable about these complicated girls who make bad decisions. I think a little bit of us can relate to things they do. And I think that's the challenge in creating mean girl characters that pop off the page is that you don't want to make them into just a stereotype of a mean girl because nobody's mm -hmm. going to relate to that. Everyone's just going to hate that person on site. Mm -hmm. But if you can make that person have human vulnerable qualities and insecurities that kind of leave the reader nodding and thinking, yeah, okay. Um, I, I felt that way too, or, you know, mm -hmm. um, in terms of peer pressure or bullying, especially like in, in the girls are also nice here. Like I really dug into my main character, Ambrosia's insecurities because, um, especially starting college, I think we all had them where you want to get in with the right friend group. You want to make the right first impression, especially if you hated your high school years, it's a chance to reinvent yourself. And mm -hmm. um, I really went deep into that because I wanted readers to be able to relate to her and not just hate her because of the horrible things she's done. Mm -hmm. And I also feel like we've all known that like one toxic friend, it was like, a, you know, um, terrible person <laughs> my kids in the back <laughs> i'm just glad mine is quiet forever <laughs> yeah that, that's so true about like the one <laughs> i um my book little monsters I, i've talked about this at events before but i mean though those girls like Bailey and Jade, the, the main characters, best friends, like I, I knew those girls in high school. Yeah. And I was lucky that I extricated myself from those friendships after high school, but it's just scary to think about, like, especially it, it's something that I love about the girls are also nice here. It's like Ambrosia has all these insecurities, but then she meets somebody who's like genuinely a sociopath and brings out like all of these nasty things in her that she didn't know that she was capable of. And yeah. I, I feel like I've known people like that in real life where by themselves, like they, they were okay. And then like, maybe they became friends with this person and they just kind of like, I don't know, like riled each other up and brought out the worst in each other. And like, as I watched that happen in real time to like two of two of my friends in high school, um, and did what any normal person would do. And I'm like, all right, I got to change their names and write them into a book. Um, <laughs> well, it's so That's what though. any normal like, writer would do. <laughs> it's true though. Like with, with um, 
you want to kind of leave your reader thinking, wow, maybe this could have happened to me. Like, yeah. you know, like these characters make horrible decisions, but it's mm -hmm. like what drove them to that limit? And it's meeting the wrong person at the wrong time. It tells mm -hmm. you what you want to hear. It tells you the right things. It can be very intoxicating. And um, it's, it's so true. You talked, I've heard from so many readers who are like, I knew a Sully. I knew one in high school, I knew one in college. And it's like, wow, I think we all knew that person. And I like what Kara's saying about like the people who are friends with that person on their own. I find like, I, I still remember from high school, like the, the cool girl crowd, like some of them, if you fought them on their own were perfectly nice, but when they're with the, the queen bee, they turn nasty. And I think that's just a thing like that happens to teenage girls. Mm -hmm. group, group dynamics and, yeah. and it's, I love exploring that as well. And I also love, it's like the glittering world of that central figure. Like you want to be close to it and a part of it, either literally the character or as readers, like we get like a view into it, but then there's always also like that, that horror exactly of like, what do you become when you are around that kind of person? And what does that say about you? Uh, and yes, we've all, we've all we all know that person and then we've all been there whether we like it or or not i i experienced things in fandom mine was fandom less than high school because i really wasn't cool in high school but where you realize the toxicity that you you can become part of and i just love that for thrillers as well because it's it's i like it when a good mystery thriller suspense unsettles the reader and we can actually talk a bit about that i feel like we all yeah. do that like i I still have like feelings about all all eyes on her and like what I think <laughs> is true, but um, we all write thrillers that aren't necessarily easy, which I think is is some are more books are more pat than others. So like when you guys write your books, do you set out to have that unsettling ending or theme or answer, or does it come to you in the writing process or editing process? I mean, it's always a goal. Um, it's just a matter of how how it takes shape in the book. Um, I always like to like. I, I never want to like just do things for shock value. My goal is always to just like create a, a conversation or or tough, ask tough questions. Um, and I know like one of one of your questions, Alexa, that we were talking about, or, like things that we could ask each other, is like what um has influenced us and i think like some of my favorite thrillers um my all-time favorite thriller book and movie um they're very different i think the, the movie's great the book is fantastic gone baby gone the end um just when you when you finish that and you're like oh my god like what did i just watch and like you need to go and talk about it with somebody and anybody you talk to people are going to be so split on whether mm -hmm. what the, the choice that the main character made like i wouldn't have done that or i would have done that or and it gets you into like these big, like bigger questions about what you would have done. And I think to really just like be able to be immersed in a story like that and to get just really like thinking and passionate about it, that's always what I want to achieve. I mean, some books more than others, um, but yeah, so it does emerge like during the drafting process, like how, how can I get there? I mean, I have this plot, I know what's going to happen. I know who did it, but what are the bigger questions I want to ask? Yeah. Yeah, for me, I'm, I don't know, I'm such a chaotic drafter. I just, I don't plot anything. So I think um, I always feel like if I'm surprising myself, I can surprise readers, hopefully. So that's always sort of what I want. But I'm the same as Kara. Like, I don't like to do, just put things in for shock value. I think things need to be grounded in in the character and, and have it feel like something that character would actually do. And yeah. So that's um, something really important to me. I think my books are really character driven um in general so um you know when i start to write a book and write a character i get to know them and i'm like is this something that this person's going to do or is this going to feel disingenuous so if if it sort of feels right for the character and i i do generally find um yeah if i can surprise myself with maybe something a plot twist or something like that i generally hope i can surprise people reading it um yeah. i when i when i um, start drafting and stuff, I keep a separate Word document full of like random comments, things I need to change. Or if I think of a plot twist, I'll throw it in there and um, come back to it. So um, sort of a chaotic process. And, you know, I never really know if I've achieved it until other people start reading it and tell me if I've 
kind of called it off. <laughs> Are you also sometimes like shocked when you have? I like don't believe like you'll I'll, I'll hear from a reader like oh I was really surprised I was like you were I thought I was so obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so much. Because it's like, you're so sick of your own book. You've read it 5 billion times. It's like, yeah. really? Wow, you thought it was good? You liked it? Oh, awesome. <laughs> I don't believe you. Yeah. Uh, and and same, I, I I feel really driven by the, I think we're all similar, like driven by the characters. And it's, it's, it's the, you know, well, if they're messy, they're not going to make pat decisions or choices. They'll make complicated ones that can mess up the plot, so to speak. Um, Cause the same with, with the Ivies, I actually wrote a very pat, not unsettling ending. And then I changed it. Uh, my editor asked me, well, I don't think she knew what she was asking me to do. She asked me to change one thing, but it's a domino effect. That one thing mm -hmm. impacted my main character. And I was like, after that has changed, she's not going to make good choices. It cannot have, it has to have an unsettling ending. And I was so nervous because I was like, some people hate those kinds of endings and thrillers and I like them, but I was so scared to like do what I wanted, but it, it worked out. Uh, but that brings us to plotting versus pantsing. So Lori, you're a chaos process writer. Me too. What about you, Kara? How do you write your thrillers? I have had to abandon that life. Um, <sighs> I, I tried to just wing it with that weekend and, um, I mean, that the, the editorial process for this book was um, probably the most brutal one that I've ever been through, and it kind of made me reevaluate how I approach things. And um, so I realized that I do have to outline because with it, it's like you said, there, there's the domino effect. Plotting a mystery or a thriller is kind of like building a Jenga tower. If you remove one piece, everything is going to collapse. You've yep. like messed with the structure because everything leading up to that moment might not make sense. So I realized that if I wanted to um, write a draft of a thriller and not have it be draft one of like 10,000, that I would have to just be a little bit more intentional in how I plot out. And I don't like to like plot everything out to a T, but um, I have to like put on, I have to be able to visualize in front of me before I start a book now, those, those big main beats of the book, like those non-negotiable moments, like this has to happen. The character has to get from A, B, C to D to for it to make sense to arrive at the ending I want and then like of course along the way like things do change um but so I have really tried to I I fought tooth and nail outlining I don't think I outlined any of that I mean I, I had like a big one page outline that would go to my editor before I start writing right before I start writing <laughs> before I started writing um that I was like okay this is, this is gonna happen in the book but I realized like that's not enough for me anymore if I'm going to like trying to make things more complicated with every book I need to kind of like have more of a plan. I need to learn your ways because I'm <laughs> I'm I'm also I'm so sick of having the messiest first drafts in history and like revision being so painful. So I keep telling myself I'm going to learn how to outline. It just hasn't happened yet. I keep fighting it like you said. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a very demented outline process. Um, I basically just keep a stream of consciousness in my phone in a note. Like I just like plot everything out and then I'll have like things written down in a million different places and then I'll just like sit down and try to compile everything. So it's not, it's not organized by any means, but um, it's just been working for me so far on, the, on this new book I'm working on. I don't think I'll ever formally outline because I know myself but yeah I, I'm kind of in the middle like I also like I have a million files in Scrivener where it's just like timeline red herrings ideas and um one thing I do do is I do write a synopsis which it, at least does help me with the top line and then I can still discovery write the fun stuff yeah that's that's um, what I can't let go of the fun part where you're like <laughs> you throw yourself in well, and I mean, this also ties into a question that I saw somebody ask um, about, do you ever, like, how do you break through just getting bored of your book um, when you've been working on it so long? And I think that's kind of a, a problem that I've been bumping up on with outlining when you, when you just thought about the book so much and spent so much time outlining, sitting down to write it is kind of like 
the magic is gone because you've thought so much about the plot that you're like you sit down to to write and you're like I don't really know these characters yet. Um, they're just kind of like going from point A to point B to be vehicles in this elaborate plot that I painstakingly um, mapped out over like the course of drafts back and forth with my editor and stuff. So I do think that that is a downside to over outlining. Um, so as helpful as it could be, like you have to make sure that there are ways that like you keep the love alive for the actual book and the, just like the ways that you get to know your character and like the discovery process, like you're writing and it's like, oh, this character likes like this band or something. Like I didn't know that about her. It just came to me because that's who she is. Yeah. And I, I, I thought that question was interesting too. Same. That's partly why I can't outline as much, but when I do get not so much, bored but stuck or if I'm on a part that feels boring so to speak sometimes I'll literally just throw like a trope in that I know I like I'll like throw in something like a micro twist to get me excited again um but also I will save because I do write linearly I don't know about you guys do you jump around in your thrillers at all I'm a hot yeah. mess <laughs> 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 uh, well, but I, I I always save some of my favorite like tropes or moments for the third act set piece. So I'm always like it's like a cookie at the end, and I like I I'll have to I'll like force myself through those so-called boring parts. But I personally don't get too tired of it because I don't plan enough ahead to get tired of it but maybe maybe someday that'll happen. I, I feel like publishing pushes all of us closer to outlining by default of the process they'll, they'll be like no we're not going to give you a lot of time to figure this out plan your book <laughs> yeah so that's that's also something i wanted to talk to you guys about um it's just something that i've been thinking about a lot lately and i know like I, i've done a bunch of these virtual events and i love how many um aspiring authors tune in i just think it's so cool and um, it just got me like thinking about like my own process and stuff. And like you said, like not having a lot of time on a book um, sometimes. And if I could like a lot of people ask like, what advice would you give to an unpublished author? And I, I honestly miss being an unpublished author sometimes because I enjoyed writing more when I didn't have a deadline looming over me. Um, I don't think I've, I haven't not had a deadline looming over me since like, I mean, my, I sold my first book in 2011. So that was the last time that I actually was able to write a book without a deadline. Um, the book that eventually became The Darkest Corners, I sold that to my current editor on a proposal. So I only had like 50 pages and a synopsis. So even that, um, like this new project that I dove into that I was really excited about, like I, I, I sold it and then I had to, to finish writing it with a deadline over me. So I was just thinking, like, lately I've been playing with um, a project in a different genre that hasn't sold yet, and I'm just finding that I just enjoy writing so much more, knowing that, like, at the end of the day, if I don't want to show this to anybody, I, I don't have to. I mean, like, I would like to eventually, like, show it to my agent and stuff, but just knowing that nobody's waiting for it, that's just taken so much of the pressure off. So I was wondering, like, if you guys have had a project like that, that kind of... I think it's so, yeah. The so important. <laughs> it's important to have those like passion projects. Um, I think that's how the girls are all so nice here got started. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell anyone about it. I was like, um, got kind of guarding it because I wanted it to feel like not a chore, like it was fun in mm -hmm. something different and not put too much pressure on myself because publishing does make you put pressure on yourself and compare yourself to other people and mm -hmm. it, it can be brutal. So I definitely, I think it's important. And even now, like, even if I'm so busy and don't have time to, you know, actually start to draft something just for me, I always have like notes apps open on my phone so that I can be thinking about, you know, future ideas, things that excite me that I want to explore. And maybe I'm not going to write it right this second, but something that I, I want to go back to because, um, you know, that's keeps the, the passion alive. And I think you know, it's true when you're, you have a deadline, it does take some of the enjoyment out of writing something. Um, in some ways it's good because it gives you a kick in the pants to, mm -hmm. to get it done, which, you know, 
can be the hardest thing for an um, aspiring author. For me, when I started out, the hardest thing was, you know, getting past my perfectionism to finish something. So I still struggle with that. But I think it's important to, you know, always be working on something or have something in your head that you're excited about and passionate about and it's just for you and doesn't really matter, you know, that you're trying to get rid of those external pressures. Like, what are the readers going to think? What is my agent going to think? What's my editor going to think? So you need to have that space to be really creative, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's why I wish we would move away from the book a year pressure. Because um, I incidentally, like accidentally, have ended up more on like an 18 months between book mm -hmm. schedule. And I vastly prefer it. And even that feels a little tight sometimes, like how fat you still have to write decently fast for that. Mm -hmm. um, because it, what I've struggled with, and, and I'm having it on this one because it's the first book I've sold on proposal. And from like selling it to sending it to copy edits is like less than eight months, which is bonkers to me. Having to accept that it's not necessarily going to be the book you want it to be. It'll be the best version of the book you can write and edit in the time that you have. And that can still be something great, but like in a best case scenario, if you gave yourself however many years you could, it could be mm -hmm. even better. Um, and throw, like exactly fighting the perfectionism of like, Oh, but in my mind, it could be this amazing, but it, it could still be good. Um, and so I wish generally like there was less deadline pressure because like that's how I feel with 18 months between books rather than it like some people are on that year book year schedule and it's unrelenting. Um, but I definitely I, I, I feel that pressure. I also have some side things where I'm like, oh, I can take my time and like incubate them and like, you know, write it the way I want. It's nice. <laughs> Oh, so we had a question come in about that actually. So what stops you from taking longer and then selling it? It must be your own choice to sell on proposal. Um, in full, full transparency, um, I did it for the money because at the time I was I was really young. I was like 23 years old. Um, I needed that guarantee of a sale. So I didn't just yeah. like take six months to write a book and then it like, all right, it's not going to sell. Um, yeah. I got to go find something else to do. Um, so I, I did it for the money. I have continued to do that because it's very hard to turn down like the guaranteed paycheck of selling a book on proposal. Um, but I know a lot of other writers feel differently about that. Um, I've been working with the same editor for a really long time, so I kind of know what to expect. I know a lot of authors that would never sell to like a new house, a new publisher, a new editor on proposal because I mean, you don't know if you and that editor are going to see eye to eye on the final draft or like maybe things change, maybe you want to change your outline. I do know people that have sold books on proposal and then like the editor got the book and it was like not what they were expecting or wanted at all. So it was a really difficult revision process. So in general, I do think if you're in the position to sell a full manuscript, it's always better because everybody knows what, what, they, what they paid for, what they bought. Um, you're more likely to be on the same page about revisions with your editor if they've read the whole book. Um, in the future, I'm not sure is something that I will continue to do just because I mean, I, I have, even though I enjoy working with my editor and I always think that I wind up publishing a book that I could be proud of that I sold on proposal, it's very hard to feel like once the train leaves the station, you can't, like there's no stopping it. Um, just like for some insight into the process with that weekend, um, my last book before that weekend came out in 2018. So I had a three year gap between books, which when I realized that it was going to be three years, I was like, oh God, it's the end of the world. My career is over. Like readers aren't going to wait. Um, so I would say to like anybody, like if, if you're feeling the pressure about the 18 month schedule, don't. Um, readers readers will wait. They'll um, wait. Yeah, I, I waited they, for you. <laughs> there, thank you. I think there's something to say about like the book a year. I mean, if people can do that and, and crank out a quality book every year, and people are going to keep showing up and, and buying those books. That's fantastic. But I've also seen like a lot of people just like absolutely like punish themselves yep. to get a book out a year and Burnout. Seeing diminishing yeah. returns eventually because I mean, people are still like discovering your books years after they're published so um i think there's something to be said for just like if if you need more time you can always take it and that's the position that i found myself in with that weekend like i had had several drafts that my editor and i were like we just, i just this is not your best book we, and we can't publish anything 
less than what's your best. So I went back to the drawing board and I wound up taking three years, but at the end of the day, like it's, it's a book that I can stand behind and that I'm proud of. And that's so important. People shouldn't underestimate that. Like my biggest fear is putting out a book that I don't like. Um, I'd rather take the time. <laughs> and I'm always glad to know that like my editor will tell me if I mess up. And But then I don't believe her when she tells me it's good. I'm like, I don't believe her. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. I had a three year gap between my first book and um, my next book. So between first and last girl lied to. And I was the same as I was like, oh my God, everyone's gonna forget I exist, but people don't. And, and it's, it is way more important to, you know, put out a book that you're proud of and that you don't have regrets about because you know it could have been better if you had taken the time and not tried to cram yourself into a publishing schedule. So I think it, the quality is always helpful. Mm -hmm. I've come to accept the past, like I, I've had to reevaluate the past three years and that gap where I didn't have a book come out, like what type of writer I wanted to be. And I realized like, I don't necessarily want to be a fast writer. I want to be a thoughtful writer. And if I can't achieve both at the same time and I have to pick, I'm going to pick being a more thoughtful writer. Yeah. And it, I think that's so hard when you're locked into a commercial genre because the mm -hmm. pressure is there to like pump out books fast. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, it's, I agree. I would, I would also always rather write something that has something to say that does something interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, somebody, one of my author friends told me like when I was fretting one of the many meltdowns I had about my bush, book being pushed yet again, she told me that readers will forgive a late book, but they're not going to forgive a bad book. So. Yeah. That's, I love that. Oh, I'm revising right through. now. So I'm like, <laughs> oh, pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so do we want to do the power for like 30 minutes q a uh yeah sure let's um look at some of these i know we and kind of answered a couple in the chat earlier so maybe um okay this one has six votes we want to answer that one yeah so how do you approach writing the third act in a thriller how do you make it feel different that's a good one well, I go in guns blazing to a third act. It's I love writing the third act. It's it's, it's the whole reason I write a book. And there were also questions about like how you plan your thriller, and I plan the end first. So it is literally the thing I I always like plan my favorite tropes or like an exciting set piece. Um, so for me, the goal is like I want it to be really exciting because. You, and mind you, you can fix this in editing, but the idea is theoretically you have built something up and then you're rolling them down a hill and they should feel like a frenetic momentum and it should culminate. And the things that I think about are pacing in the third act. Like you want to make sure like the beats are hitting where both people will expect them to, but also like throw in some surprises, but um length of like confrontations and feeling like you get all the emotional like like arc out of it um i i i really it's a feeling thing for me like i don't have like i know some people will outline it this way but it's like when i'm in it it's like okay how is the reader gonna read this coming off of everything that's come before and am i delivering the like the kind of experience I like in a thriller, like mm -hmm. scratching all the itches and like hitting all the punches. Um, and I'm, I, I don't know what the question means by different. Um, so I'll, I'll let you guys jump in. And if, if they're in the chat, it, like what they mean, like different from your other books or different from other people's books. I'm just curious. I, I took it to mean, I guess, different from the previous two acts. Like are, are there different oh. <laughs> I guess just are there different rules you follow or things you try to touch on. I guess for me, the third act for me, um, purely from just like crafting a mystery standpoint, I, I don't try to introduce any new questions in the third act. I mean, I've, I've spent the first two acts bringing up all these questions and the questions breed more questions. Um, by the third act, it's, it's kind of, it's time to start answering those questions. So that's just kind of how I think about it. I don't know what you, how you interpreted it, Lori. Um, yeah, I interpret it the same way. Um, I would like the worst, and I don't even think about acts when I'm writing, but like, I, I always feel like this great sense of like sliding down the line, but they're not just like you're out of the side in the middle of the 
which is like the worst road where you're just kind of plowing through and it's like, I don't know what I'm drafted. I'm like, oh my god, this is the zero out of five. Terrible. It was just like, there's no tension. Tension's disappeared. But I always force myself to get through it. And then you're rewarded with that when things kind of start coming together in that moment. And then I feel like I always end up writing extremely fast to get to the end because I'm excited. And I'm like, I think I know where this is heading and I'm excited to unravel this. And, and like Carol would say, like answering questions that you don't really want to throw any like questions to your reader like Mm -hmm. i i I love um you know reading and writing like a really fun journaling with like an extra form of my stuff like that so i'm kind of you know like i want to make the reader feel cheated by like you know the next to answer questions of the story is brought up in a a way that feels if you're cutting out a little bit lori maybe like (laughs) is it i don't know uh it's about the same Might be just a connection thing. Can you see me now? Yeah, we could we could see you. Your voice is just a little like oh. it sounds like a little far off. Weird. I don't know. Um, yeah. Sorry. Um, um, anyway. oh, okay. Should we pull up another question? Okay. So, what comes to you first when you start a new idea for a thriller? Um, I think there was another question that was similar to that too. Like, what comes what comes first, the plot or the the characters? Um, I I usually get my ideas from things that are like actually happening um, around me, like the the camping story that inspired that weekend. So I usually have the plot first or some sort of um, setup. I rarely think of the character first. Um, I know it's very different for a lot of people like they, they start with a character and then they kind of build the plot around that. Um, I, I tend to start with plot first. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm the same. It's, it's either not so much plot, but like setup, I think is the mm-hmm. optimal word. It's like, um, the, whatever that like special thing is uh, also motives. So like with the Ivies, it, I work backwards from conceptually like competitive college admissions and, what is a good motive? Good. Uh, are there any good motives to kill someone? Uh, a good reason that someone would murder in this world. And I work backwards from that. Same. I crafted the characters around the idea. Uh, my next one. Yeah, I started with a twist. Like I am. A, and then, yeah, concepts and twists. And then I build the characters from there. Mm-hmm. I'm sort of um, a mixture. Like I, I start with... Um, like a hook and a twist kind of, um, and a character or two. Um, generally, when I'm writing a book, I know what I want the big twist to be. And that's sort of what keeps me excited about it. So generally, I'll write out like a little back copy blurb thing um, just for myself. And um, just so that I can always go back to the hook and what I wanted to say, that's usually what I do to prepare to start writing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and like the payoff has to be worth it. So I think it makes sense that we all are thinking about like, well, what is the payoff? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm just browsing the other questions. Um, so when researching for your thrillers, what's the strangest thing we'd find on your Google search history? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had to look up I think it's like the specific methods of murder that's always slightly disturbing that I that like you have to go look up well how does someone die <laughs> from this will this kill someone can a coroner find this that kind of stuff that I've had to look yes. up where I'm like wow every once in a while in my google bar I'll be like hey FBI this is for a book I am not a serial killer <laughs> just in case they're watching I was um researching something about overdoses today and it was actually very hard to find an answer. Google like thought I had a drug problem and kept recommending me resources. <laughs> no, I don't need that. I just need to know like, yeah, what kind of drugs do teenagers do at parties? Because when I was in high school, I did jigsaw puzzles with my grandma on the weekend. That's not what kids are doing at parties these days. Like, <laughs> that that is true. I've had to look look up things where it's like, what do cool people do? <laughs> 
Yeah, my most of my searches have been, you know, revolving around death or coroner things. And um, I also find like legal questions are like, you know, difficult because you want to get them right. And they can be tricky. But I have two lawyers in the family, my dad and my sister. So I'm, I bug them all the time. But I'm like, just so you know, this is for a book and not yeah. happening to me in my life. <laughs> and it's hard because they vary by jurisdiction. Actually, that was a yes. weird one for the Ivies. I had to like go deep into statutory rape laws in Massachusetts, uh, which was weird. <laughs> I was like, what a weird thing to be looking up, yeah. looking for like cases and precedent. So this is my cat. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. So we answered what are your favorite thriller tropes in the chat earlier. How do you come up with your red herrings and alternative suspects? Oh, that's a good one. I could think about that. Well, and building on that, I'll ask you guys, do you know all of your red herrings and alternative suspects while you're writing, or does any of that come in editing or drafting? Uh, yeah, a lot of that stuff comes out in editing. Um, like one of my editors biggest notes on all of my drafts is about misdirection and red herrings. Um, like one of, I think my problem with my first draft is that it's just too vague. I'm trying so hard to prevent the reader from being able to guess who it is that they can't really come up with theories of their own. So my editor yeah. is like, you need to drop some like red crumbs or red herrings. Like who do you want the reader to think it was at this point? Um, before you flip it on its head. So yeah, that that definitely is a big part of the editing process for me. Same here. Mine show up randomly and I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it's all about, you really have to, you want your reader to finish the book feeling like they want to reread it again. That's always my mm -hmm. goal as a thriller writer. Because when I read a thriller I love, the first thing I want to do is pick it up and be like, oh my God, I want to go back and find all the clues that I missed. So, yeah. um, but you also want it to feel like earned because you don't want it to feel like random. Like you watched some horror movie and the killer was like some random person that you had no chance of ever guessing. That's like the worst. You just want to throw your uh, remote across the room or whatever. So, like you, you yeah. want it to feel like it, like like your reader to feel like, oh yeah, how did I not see that? So yeah. that's always sort of what I aim for and you really do have to layer in those clues and those red herrings to pull that off mm -hmm. yeah and i um when it's like a someone has died like obviously not all thrillers is like there's a murder victim and blankety blank but i i do work backwards from whoever that person is because you have to come up with legit multiple legitimate reasons for someone to die or for something to happen uh, and that's where I'll start like sometimes I'll just brainstorm a list of like reasons someone might want to kill this person and then I'll dole them out to different characters and other cases it's like this character fits this archetype so they should probably be a suspect but why would they want to do such and such and so I do it both ways because um, you're like the, the boyfriend should always have a motive to kill the girlfriend. That's just like a trope and go from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm looking at some other questions. Oh, this one is from Kathleen Glasgow. Hi, Kathleen. Um, so this is for everyone. Are the titles of the books the original titles or did they change during the editorial process? That's a really good question. Um, That's really good. The only title of mine that um, ever stuck was The Cheerleaders. Like I just, called that book with cheerleaders as a joke because it was about cheerleaders and my editor was like, what if we kept that as a title? Um, but every other of my titles changed like several times. It was, it was a battle trying to get to one that made everybody happy. Um, it's hard. I, <laughs> yeah, it's really hard. Um, for Hi, Kathleen. Um, for me, the, um, the girls are all so nice here was the only one that stuck. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to remember. I don't, Last Girl Lied To and All Eyes on Her were collaborations between, you know, myself and my editorial team. And I believe that my editor thought of All Eyes on Her and I was like, oh, that is perfect. And um, yeah, those, I guess I'm not always great at titles. They're really tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the Ivies was my title, but it's the only title of a book I've ever had that started there and ended there. Uh, and it was just like, I love how in thrillers when they have like pithy, like 
this is what the book is about titles, but like they have double meanings. And so that's where that, that came from. But like on my next one, I'm struggling, man. The, the working title changed for submission and then the submission title is technically announced, but we're thinking of changing it and I have no good ideas. And it, it's, it's exactly, it's like, is it a line in the book? It is a, is it a theme from the book? Is it a pun? Is that too cheesy? It, it's hard. And I, I keep hoping someone smarter than me will title my next book better than I can. Cause yes. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Let's consult our other questions. Also, I'm curious as if you, do you write one draft first and then edit or edit as you write? Mm. Um, I do a little bit of both. It's kind of like a hybrid. I always like to have a full complete draft before I get into like the nitty gritty of revisions, but I definitely edit myself as I go. If I'm just not happy with something, I'll, I'll go back and, and tweak, especially if like I get stuck somewhere. Um, I usually think like, oh, I, I don't actually have writer's block. I probably went wrong somewhere in the first few chapters. So I'll go back and, and look over mm -hmm. it see if anything needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. yeah, I plow straight ahead to the end. <laughs> I need it. I like, I just want to finish the draft. So I don't edit as I go because I lose momentum if I do that. Mm -hmm. And then I just procrastinate. So I just, my goal is always just to get the draft finished as ugly as it is and then mm -hmm. start revising it. <laughs> That's generally me as well, because I don't actually, in, well, I mean, I've come to enjoy drafting enough as, as much as I need to, because we clearly have to draft the book, but revision, <laughs> exactly. I want to get through it. Yeah. But I'm finding now it's like, it depends on the book, because with this this one that I sold on Proposal, I, actually, I got to the middle and I realized I had so many fundamental problems with my original act one, and they were bothering me so much, I was, I couldn't keep going. And I did actually go back to the beginning and totally revise act one. I've never done that before. And I'm just impressed I finished, like it worked. But generally my advice is not to edit as you go. Cause I think it's better to, especially with the thriller, like finish the whole thing, see the mm -hmm. whole picture and then fix it. But um, in this case I did. And although now I'm just going through again and changing most of act one again. So <laughs> maybe it's just cause act one is hard. Yeah, it, it's hard to suppress those perfectionist tendencies as you're mm -hmm. writing. And I think, yeah, the biggest hurdle is just getting a draft and then knowing that the heavy lifting has to come later. Yeah. I think we have time for maybe one more question or depending on how long of a question. Um, oh, this is, a, I like this one. So I mentioned the difference between a story and a thriller, second guessing your close relationships. Could you all say more about that? So I guess the difference between a mystery and a thriller um, is something they would like us to talk about. Do you guys have any strong thoughts on the difference between a mystery and a thriller? Pacing, for sure. I think a mystery can be a little slower, a little more character driven. Um, but I also think you can have hybrids. Like everything I write is a hybrid, I think, because I like a slower paced act one, like meaning I like digging into the character in the world. And mm -hmm. then the third act is always breakneck. Um, mm -hmm. I also think mysteries have certain tropes, like more like the investigation, like a pretty straightforward okay. investigation. Um, but I, I feel like I barely know. I Half the time I feel not smart enough to talk about this because I'm like, <laughs> well, are you guys also kind of like confused because the industry will call everything a thriller no matter what. Yeah. So I, that's why I don't it's, even know if I know the right things. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't consider my books thrillers, actually. My, I think my books are all mysteries. They're very like straightforward and that something happened and the main character wants to find out what happened. Like yeah. there's not, that thriller kind of, I think, implies a ticking time bomb or something or like something is happening like the there's there's a threat to the main character they're trying to like outrun something um i guess like i when i'm trying to explain it to people because I, I just i have trouble like explaining what i mean when i think of like my own personal definition um like gillian flynn's books gone girl is a thriller like you're seeing everything unfolds in real time and it's like oh my god what's going to happen to these people but something like Dark Places is more of a mystery where it's like mm -hmm. unraveling something that happened that has already happened. Mm -hmm. um, so like there's obviously like tension in mysteries, like the, the main character is, might, will probably be in danger, especially at the end with like that big um, confrontation. Yeah, somebody wrote that. I think the difference is the feeling of dread in thrillers. Yeah, it's kind of like just that, that 
the like you said about pacing and the way that the suspense yeah. unfolds. Um, suspense is used very differently. Like in mysteries, you have to keep the reader turning the pages by asking questions or um, with like all these clues and it's more about that the reader is trying to put things together and figure it out but in a thriller it's kind of like just racing to the end to find trying to figure out what happened mm -hmm. um, what's going to happen to the character i i think that makes sense mine mine in that definition would definitely be more mystery as well i mm -hmm. like most of my suspense is all psychological in my books mm -hmm. like I don't do like blood and gore really. It's my stuff is mostly just a lot of mind games. Um, so <laughs> I think um, it's it's more along the lines of a, of a mystery as well. I wouldn't like thriller to me is like you know high octane like big thrills and big things like that. And I'm, my books generally aren't like that. They're more um, they're more mind games and character dynamics and relationships are more of the focus. I also think it, it depends on how the story is told too. Like I, the girls are also nice here is like so good as a thriller, even though like it is a mystery. I think just the way that you watch things unfold because the main character knows what happened. Well, she knows, she thinks she knows what happens. Like, it's not like she she's like investigating a mystery that happened to somebody that she knows. Like she was very involved and she's keeping certain things from the reader and she's letting it unfold in in real time as like there's this person that is sending her these notes so there's that sense of dread that she's going to be exposed but um she also doesn't have the complete picture of what happened so i think i don't know my favorite books combine elements of both um yeah. and thrillers agree mm -hmm. i i do wish publishing would make it more clear with labels <laughs> but thriller is clearly a marketing <laughs> label so well, and it's also mystery maybe has the connotation of being like more slow paced, the detective novel. But, I think um, that's why, because like to them, mystery is like a cozy and yeah. or detective. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or like very like Veronica Mars, where it's like a, a teen investigator is like taking yeah. up the puzzle, yeah. like the sleuth and stuff. But um, yeah. Um, should we do one more question? We're at 57 minutes, maybe. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to see one that... There's one about plot holes? Yeah, that sounds good. Let's do that. Yeah. I don't see it, too. I'll let you uh, So how do you go about searching for plot holes and trying to patch them up without changing everything? Um, this kind of comes back to the planning thing. Um, some things you can't change without ruining the whole book so your choice is then either rewrite it or plan enough that that doesn't happen but like from a practical standpoint you have a lot of people read the book who are not you because when you know everything and you literally wrote it and you're that close to the story you won't see the plot holes as easily i have an army of like a bench of alpha beta readers and i use them at different stages in addition to my editor my poor editor our poor editors have to read our books over and over again yeah. um Thanks, but Sydney. like I'll, I'll always be like all right i need fresh eyes because i revised something and i always say questions anything that's confusing anything that feels like a continuity error tell me and that's how I, I use other people basically to help me figure out what I failed to do. <laughs> yeah, that, that's such a good point about additional pairs of eyes. Um, with that weekend, the reason that it took so many drafts is that there were so, because the main character has memory loss. So um, just the way that the story unfolded, there were so many plot holes coming up like that just affected that had ramifications all throughout the, the plotting of the book. And my editor and I just still were like missing stuff between drafts. And it wasn't until she had somebody else at the publisher, like an editorial assistant read with a fresh pair of eyes and then point out even more plot holes that we were able to like come up with a more concrete plan to fill them in that wouldn't completely upend the work that we already did. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, Cause you know, no matter like obviously when you're done your first draft it's riddled with plot holes especially like at least mine are but then you know you get to a point where you're happy with it but if you send it to someone else they will find your discrepancies and my agent is brilliant at this so she reads all my stuff and like i can always count on her to be like i have a list of questions and i'll be like oh my god how did i miss that so 
<laughs> you know, we trust and you know your editorial team and your readers if, um, like team partners and beta readers and friends like having those people mm-hmm. you trust like mm-hmm. isn't valuable <laughs> mm-hmm. yes yeah no same and, and i also will say like don't always think of them as plot holes because sometimes you'll have someone point something out and you realize it's not so much a plot hole but like you didn't make something clear enough in the text that is technically there and it's it's just like it helps you be like oh i need to be more clear in my execution and prose so it's like deep breath it's not all plot holes <laughs> hopefully <laughs> it, it's pretty rare to have someone make a comment that and your whole book falls apart like we all we all hope that doesn't happen so. <laughs> all right i that's an hour so thank you guys for joining yeah, thank you guys me. so much thank you for waiting i know it's been a yeah. long time. thank you for tuning in and your awesome questions thank you to romans for hosting yes definitely and there's a link um at the bottom yes oh thank and you. um we should say uh, I am signing copies at Romans. So if you buy a copy of the IVs from Romans, I'm physically signing books, which is very novel uh, in the pandemic because <laughs> they are my local bookstore. And Kara, I know you're doing book plates. Yes, um, all copies of that weekend will come with a book plate um, if they're bought from Romans. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for sticking around. Um, just so everyone knows, our Romans, my Romans colleague is safe and well so no worries there um all is good so she'll reach out to you guys and thank you all for joining us and thank the three of you for being with us at romans and thank you for signing books for purchase and remember green button below will take you to all three books so thank you everyone for watching it was a great conversation and everyone have a wonderful rest of your weekend you too. Thank you, everybody.